Welcome back, listeners, to Drug Diversion Insights. Today's podcast is with Dr. John Tanner, the Medical Director for Florida's Monitoring Program, Intervention Project for Nurses, also known as IPN. They provide intervention and advocacy for impaired nurses in Florida due to substance abuse or any other issues that may affect their safety to practice in nursing. They work very closely with Professional Resource Network, known as PRN, which is the monitoring program for all other licensed healthcare professionals in Florida. Welcome, Dr. John Tanner. I really appreciate you taking the time with me today. Well, thanks for having me, Terry. <laughs> you know, I really want to talk about medication-assisted therapy and whether somebody should be allowed to return to work on MAT. But I do first want to start with an overview of IPN and how your participants enter the program. So give us a bit of an overview on your program. Well, people come to our program through a whole variety of pathways. Um, probably one of the most common is uh, we get referrals uh, from various hospitals or uh, facilities where nurses work and uh, they are flagged either through the drug dispensing system where something uh, appears to be tampered with or uh, improper documentation of uh, waste or uh, administration of medications, things like that. Uh, sometimes we have nurses that show up to work impaired uh, where they may have slowed speech or obvious cognitive impairment. Um, so that's a large source of our referrals. We also get a fair number of referrals from the uh, Board of Nursing in Florida who uh, identify that there's been some previous problems. Sometimes it's a legal problem, uh, arrest for uh, driving under the influence or uh, some other type of legal issues surrounding drugs or mental health issues. Um, sometimes colleagues themselves uh, will report um, and uh, sometimes it's the attorneys. Uh, it's not uncommon for somebody to get into trouble and they get reported to the Florida Department of Health. And uh, then a, they hire an attorney. The attorney gets involved and um, refers them to us. And it's not uncommon for the Department of Health investigators themselves to say, hey, why don't you contact IPN? Uh, see what you can do with them. And when that does happen, if there's not been any injury or harm to anyone, then most of the time they slow down their investigative process and they wait to see how things go with us if they uh, enroll in our program and, and uh, exhibit compliance. So, so we get okay. a, a number of uh, sources. Uh, there are yet others. Um, and uh, uh, if they're not referred through the Department of Health or especially the Board of Nursing, then they're really unknown to the Board of Nursing. So it's uh, mm. kept very confidential. Okay. So, so people can come into your program without the licensing board or the health department even being aware that they are in a recovery program. Yeah. So in, in, uh, in Florida, uh, people who refer such as hospitals have to either report to us if it's a, any nursing profession or they have to report to the Department of Health and they fulfill their obligation if they do either. Um, in some cases, they do both. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. But if they only report to you, to IPN, then IPN does not then report them to the health department or the uh, Board of Nursing it's kept confidential. So they could theoretically go through the entire recovery process without any licensing agency knowing that they had a substance use disorder and went for treatment. Yes. As long as they maintain <laughs> compliance with our program. Okay. Um, so there's a okay. lot of little, little details about that, but uh, yeah, if they maintain Perfect. full compliance through monitoring, if they become non-compliant and don't get back on board quick, uh, um, after like several instances where they have something that's considered non-compliant, then we have to report them. Um, 
and turn over their file, but we can continue to monitor them. And as long as they get back on board, usually nothing is done uh, once we notify the board. So. Okay. Okay. All right. So it sounds like a pretty good program. There's some checks and balances. You give somebody the opportunity to to clean things up, and if they don't, then it goes to the next level. But they have some grace while they're trying to make their way through the program in terms of how it impacts their future, right, with their careers and their license. Okay. Now, the first time we talked, you had mentioned that you're seeing less participants in the program. And we also had Deborah from the New York Peer Assistance Program on with us. And she said the same thing, that there are less participants, which I find interesting because I'm hearing that there's more people out there with mental health issues, and substance use disorders ever since COVID and stuff. So what do you attribute that decrease in participants to? Do you have any theories on that? Uh, I have theories. I don't have facts, but I do know that across the country, most monitoring programs have seen a decrease. And I know uh, even our sister organization, PRN, that monitors all the health professions other than nurses, has seen a decrease. Um, but I think COVID was a big part of this. Um, we Number one, we lost a lot of nurses uh, through COVID. Uh, they there was a lot of burnout, uh, even some post-traumatic stress disorder that we saw where nurses were so traumatized by all the the death and sadness of, of in some cases, young people. And uh, so we there was a lot of burnout. A lot of nurses had to put in so much overtime and, uh, and it really stressed the system. And so there's a, a more a shortage, basically, of, of nursing professions out there. And I think the hospitals may have a little reluctance to turn a nurse over. They try and manage it in-house, so to speak, a little bit more nowadays. They, uh, they try and keep the nurse on board. And by the time they get to us, they're a lot sicker in most cases. They've been, there's evidence that they've been diverting uh, several times and they've been warned several times. And by the time they get to us, they tend to be much uh, worse off. So I think that has at least something to do with it. There's also a lot more uh, people that we see that are uh, hiring lawyers these days, and mm -hmm. they spend a lot of money on attorneys, and then they don't have the money they need to get the treatment they need, or they don't need to uh, they don't have the money for even an evaluation in some cases. And that's not to say that there's some really good nurse uh, lawyers out there that give very good advice as far as all this is concerned. But uh, a lot of them, they, they want, you know, six, seven thousand dollars up front to take on a, a case and uh, and then they go through all that money and then they, they don't they they drop out of nursing for a long time and sometimes they don't come back sometimes we see them come back after they've saved up enough money again so oh, i think there's a lot a of factors yeah uh, yeah, yeah i always, just i'm ahead. sorry we'll say one other thing uh i think yeah. the questions uh, that the board of nursing asks of applicants have changed so uh, the question I think now is something along the lines of, do you currently have a problem? Which that can be interpreted, well, last night I didn't, I, I did, but to, right now I don't, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, it used to be in the past five years, have you had a significant mental health or addiction problem? And now it's, uh, it's a much more loosely interpreted question. So that may be a factor also. Interesting. You know, I just interviewed a lawyer and um, I didn't think about, yeah, people have to make some decisions like everything when it comes to financial, you know, do you get the lawyer or do you get treatment? I didn't think about it being an either, right? It, it should be an, an and, um, but that's kind of interesting. They, they, It's too bad. Well, I don't know. It's their well-being from a legal perspective and from a recovery perspective perspective that are so important. And we also talked about those questions on those forms and how they're interpreted or hard to interpret because they're not asked very clearly. And there's a lot of wiggle room, I guess. Are you like, well, yeah. yeah, 
not today. <laughs> um, yeah, or let me not fill this out today. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah, well, it's a shame if people are not getting the help. And I do agree with you, you know, in the hospital, there are, I've had comments too. It's like, oh no, I can't, you know, we're short staffed. You can't pull them out to interview them. Or, you know, when I say you need to be prepared that they can't return to work for the rest of their shift. And then we need to finish the investigation and we get the, no, I can't let them go. It's like, well, you kind of have to, you know, there's an issue going on here and we need to get to the bottom of it until it's settled. You're going to have to do without them. So it's true. The, the nursing managers struggle with that from a staffing perspective. All right. So you have evaluators and treatment professionals. What kind of training do they undergo in order to work for your organization? Well, we, uh, I think that's a very important aspect of our program. Um, we have evaluators that are, uh, go through our training on an annual basis and our treatment providers now also go through an annual training. We have at least, uh, their medical director or, uh, one of their administrators come and go through that training every year. So they understand the differences between treating the general public and those in a highly safety sensitive position, such as health professionals. So they go through our training every year and we provide an outline of the, the kinds of things we want in our evaluations. So, you know, we want a, a good thorough history and uh, the specific details of uh, onset and duration and extent of uh, any substance use. Uh, a good uh, mental status examination and, and thorough review of any psychiatric issues or any anything that might affect their cognitive functioning or safety to practice otherwise. So they're, they're very well trained uh, as to what the needs are and what our expectations are. So they, they understand what we need and we understand what they need. There's a, a lot of interaction that goes on uh, in those so it, it's very helpful um because i've seen evaluations by maybe a very good addiction specialist but they don't really wrap their head around the importance of the safety sensitive uh, nature of somebody returning to the workplace and uh, the extent of monitoring that's needed and the extent of treatment also we, we find people that go through adequate treatment do far better and if, if an evaluator ever recommends, you know, inadequate treatment, it turns into a revolving door where before you know it, they relapse quickly. And uh, it's been amazing to me how important that is uh, to get very good treatment up front. Um, so. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think of there being, I would think that anybody would make sure their patients got the adequate treatment, the full treatment. I don't think about it kind of being this um, difference, but I guess there's there's all different kinds of providers and professionals at different levels. So, uh, and then the safety sensitive piece, definitely there's a bit of a higher standard there when it comes to making sure yeah. that, that they're clear to go, right? Yep. So, what is your position then and IPN's position on medication assisted treatment? Is that part of your program or is it all abstinence based? Um, no, we're, uh, I'm a big believer in medication assisted treatment. Um, there's a lot of research that backs up uh, the efficacy of medication assisted treatment. It certainly is, is not the whole picture. I mean, they're, they're, to me, I, I lecture a lot on neurobiology of addiction and, and uh, you know, the whole cognitive prefrontal cortex that, uh, you know, has to grasp what true recovery is, you know, and the steps to recovery and the importance of having a, an adequate support system and all those things. But the research also shows that when you treat those limbic drive areas with medications that can well, some of the cravings and desires uh, that those help. And we have several, you know, a number of medication uh, assisted recovery products out there. 
you know, that can help with alcohol and with opiates and even smoking, not that we get too involved with the smoking aspect of things. But so, yeah, based on the research, I'm very much in support of it um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I might mention at this point, I, uh, some people may perceive that I have some bias. Uh, uh, I am one of the three physicians who did the research to get Suboxone film approved through the uh, FDA originally. And um, I am a current speaker for one of the products right now. Um, so that might be perceived as bias, but I have also had almost four decades of experience in addiction medicine and, and at least uh, since uh, I would say 2002, I've had a lot of experience working with these products in my private practice. So Okay. All right. Do you have a feel for what percentage of the participants at IPN are on medication-assisted treatment? Uh, I will tell you, we've we've always had roughly about, well, I've been medical director for over a decade now, um, and I was actually consulting even before I became medical director, but uh, we've never had more than about 1% of our participants uh, that are on a buprenorphine product. Um, it's always been, I don't think it's ever even reached 2%, it's always been around 1%. Um, and that's buprenorphine type products. Uh, initially, it was just the transmucosal sublingual formulations, and and I think we currently have uh, two participants that, that are on long-acting injectable formulations of uh, buprenorphine. I don't know the numbers for the long-acting naltrexone monthly injections, uh, but we have... Uh, many fold more that are on that type of a product than are on the buprenorphine products. And I think some of that is just the nature of the advantage that we have using these products. Um, I will tell you in my clinical practice, I find for opiate use disorder, the buprenorphine products seem to work better and that's my own clinical perspective. That's me speaking for my private practice. Whereas mm -hmm. um, uh, when it comes to alcohol, I'm much better success with the long acting, well, it's only approved for long acting uh, uh, naltrexone injections once monthly. But we have a particular advantage uh, in the monitoring programs with IPN Actually, there's two advantages to the uh, naltrexone extended release injections. One, it's uh, well, it's indicated for opiate and for alcohol. And some of our evaluators will, you know, say that they believe this participant needs to receive those injections for a designated time frame. Frequently, it's at, at least one year, sometimes uh, two years, and in one case, at least three years, they recommended that an individual with a very terrible history with relapsing, that they stay on the monthly naltrexone injections. And uh, the, the advantage we have is we can refrain them from practice if they don't get that shot within a, a few days of their due date. Um, and so that's a strong incentive for a nurse to, or any of the nursing professions to stay compliant with getting those injections. And it works out great. The other big advantage is, um, if a nurse does not have a history of diverting, uh, sedative hypnotic medications, which are commonly available in most nursing settings, and they don't have a sedative use disorder diagnosis, then uh, we very frequently will allow the nurse, if they have any history of diversion, to receive those injections in lieu of having a controlled access restriction. In other words, the controlled medication access restriction that allows them to administer narcotics and, and other controlled medications uh, is a big barrier for some nurses finding employment. And if, if we can say, you're getting your monthly injection, you can now administer those medications, uh, then that, that frees up uh, the nurse to 
uh, find better employment. Um, so I find there's two two mm -hmm. advantages with the naltrexone. The oral naltrexone, I will say, is very hard to track. We we do drug levels with that, um, but the levels can go so low within a 24-hour time frame with the oral formulations of naltrexone that uh, it, we have to check to a, a lower level, near the level of detection. And uh, I'm concerned because uh, compliance can be a big issue. I mean, there's nothing to say that the nurse knows are going to test that day. So they won't just take the oral formulation before they go for their tests. So I have okay. a lot of yeah, when you talk about that. Any when complaint. you talk about the drug tests, you're testing for the naltrexone not something else in their system. Right, right, yes. So. Okay, okay. Do you incorporate drug tests for the opioids while they're also on these treatments as well, or? Oh, absolutely, yes, that, yeah. We, we yeah. randomly test, uh, you know, throughout the month. Uh, sometimes we increase the frequency. I, I don't think we ever, if, if there's a substance use disorder diagnosis, it's never less than two times a month. Uh, but uh, um, sometimes it's it's more frequently depending on the circumstances. And, and then we do special testing for certain types of uh, substances also. And we do okay. hair testing and we, we do okay. pet testing uh, in, uh, on our nurses also. Okay, all of it. Is methadone ever part of the MAT? I only know of one case that we ever uh, had that was on methadone. Um, I will say most of our participants who are on a buprenorphine product, it's on the, the recommendation of their evaluator, uh, or if they go through a, a one of our healthcare specific uh, approved programs and the treatment providers we know are almost always uh, have access at least to our, our eva approved evaluators. Um, if they recommend somebody should be on a buprenorphine product, then um, that's when the, they wind up being on it. Otherwise, we don't generally have them on a buprenorphine product. And I will say that uh, that 1% that I spoke of, probably 80% of those do have a chronic pain diagnosis also. It's not just solely an opiate use disorder. So, so the evaluators, if they see somebody as a significant chronic pain issue, even though the buprenorphine products aren't FDA approved for pain treatment, they certainly do work and uh, it's a big reason why our nurses that wind up on buprenorphine uh, are approved to do so. <laughs> okay, all right. So overall though, I mean, 1% is a pretty low percentage, it seems to me. Yes. They're just as successful in their recovery, not on MAT. And I mean, there are reasons why they recommend the MAT over the other, but you're seeing high success no matter what they follow yes. the recommendations okay all right yeah so now coming back to work on mat that's a big topic um a lot of people are like no they might be impaired and you just don't know so what are your thoughts on that and how do you get somebody back to work who's on mat well, we rely very heavy on what the evaluator recommends there are cases where the evaluator will recommend that somebody have a return to work evaluation again with an approved evaluator before they go back. But one thing we have required um, for the majority of the last decade that I've been uh, working with IPN is neurocognitive testing. I have wanted that solely uh, because there's so much controversy that surrounds this. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody's aware there's uh, been controversy with health professionals receiving MAT. Um, I never wanted anyone to come out of the woodwork and say, oh, your nurse made a mistake because they're on a, a transmucosal buprenorphine or a long-acting buprenorphine. Um, and so 
you know, that this becomes a non-issue because we do, ex, you know, extensive neurocognitive testing. That neurocognitive testing includes, you know, both cognitive functioning, short-term, long-term memory, ability to take on, switch from one task to another, uh, you know, the verbal processing, the visual processing, the um, manual dexterity is included in that, um, and a whole variety of, of complex testing is included to assure that they're safe to practice. And I will tell you, we have never, since I've been here, we have never had a nurse. Uh, and by the way, we wait until they've been a stable, steady dose of the, the, the buprenorphine product for at least two weeks because I don't want somebody just starting on it and then getting the testing. They need to be on a stable, steady dose. And then they have that neurocognitive testing. And we've never had a single nurse uh, that has had that neurocognitive testing where the evaluator, uh, which is generally a, either a PhD psychologist or a psy doctorate uh, psychologist who's well qualified. And they're, they, by the way, are also approved by us to do the evaluation. But we've never had a single one who said one of our nurses is not safe to practice uh, on that. I can't say the same with some <laughs> other things. We have on occasion had somebody that's on a benzodiazepine or something and and they are not have not been shown to be safe and i don't think any of our current evaluators recommend that people be on something like a benzodiazepine so okay all right so they take that so if they're in there for an opioid use disorder but they're also on a benzodiazepine for anxiety that's kind of a whole different ballgame when it comes to, and you'll pick that up on the neurocognitive testing. It's, yeah, I mean, we they yeah. don't we don't generally approve them. If they are, if they do need a benzodiazepine, like if a psychiatrist, uh, like they've been evaluated and, and they're considered not safe to work, then what they can do, they can go through medication protocol. And if their psychiatric medication provider, it might be a psychiatric nurse practitioner or psychiatrist feels they need to intermittently have a benzodiazepine for uh, their severe anxiety levels or panic attacks, then they would have to go through what we call a medication protocol where they refrain from practice. Uh, and then when they have finished using it, then they would drug test negative and then they're cleared to go back to nursing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot to this. I mean, what, so the neurocognitive test sounds very extensive. Is this a multi-day test? Is this a multi-hour test? How does that, what does that look like? Certainly multi-hour, uh, mm -hmm. and it sometimes is a part of a multi-day evaluation. And most of our, uh, especially our healthcare-specific treatment providers, very frequently do that as part of the treatment process because doing that gives a lot of guidance to the treatment. You know, they can identify cognitive issues early on in treatment, and then they maybe repeat it before the person leaves the program. Or they may identify, like, uh, the, the personality components of that testing. They may identify factors that need to be addressed while they're in treatment. So many of our good healthcare-specific treatment providers do that as a routine, uh, or if they see any screening type things that raise a red flag, then they go ahead and do that, so. Sure, pieces of it can be incorporated at any time, but there's the full testing at the end before there's the, you can go back to work kind of thing. What What is involved in the training for somebody to do that? Is it a specific certification or can any good therapist no, no, no. It's, uh, yeah, the, the neurocognitive testing is done specifically by uh, people we've approved. They're always PhD psychologist or uh, PSYD sci doctorate uh, psychologist okay. who have had specific training in this. And, and they're the ones we approve uh, generally work with uh, safety sensitive type populations so they understand the importance that uh, you don't want to just compare the uh, the findings to the general population. You want to 
compare them to the level of expectation in the field that they're in. So they, they use, you know, uh, the population data from the cohort that specifically works in that healthcare fields, for instance. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so what would you say to hospitals that are considering a program of a return to work, you know, allowing people to return to work, but they are inclined to say nobody on MAT can, you know, that's, that's a no-go. What would you say to them? Well, number one, they might be up for a lawsuit because <laughs> uh, based, based, based on the research nowadays, uh, you know, and, and based on all of our experience, by the way, we're in the process of, of uh, getting research uh, published, but uh, on uh, medication assisted recovery or medication assisted treatment. But, um, you know, they're, they may be up for a lawsuit because, uh, I, I think it, there's some pretty solid evidence these days that that people can safely function on these medications. Um, I know it's still controversial in many people's mind, but I, I see there's a definite shift in the understanding of all this as time goes on. Um, I mean, if somebody is in a monitoring program like ours, uh, I think... The high, and I will tell you, I know of at least one regional hospital in our area here who says they get their best nurses from our program. Uh, these nurses are very closely monitored. They go to weekly nurse support groups. So we have eyes and ears on, on that nurse every single week. Uh, they, uh, we have a workplace uh, supervisor. So somebody who has eyes on that nurse every single day that can let us know immediately if they see any changes or difference. Um, and, and they're drug tested on a regular basis. And in many cases, they're undergoing uh, psychiatric treatment and or uh, psychotherapy, which to me, probably everybody could use that, to be honest. Yeah. It's, I, I think it, it just helps people to, to move to a healthier self. Um, so we we get glowing reports uh, from the hospitals and supervisors about our nurses in many cases. I'm not saying 100%. I mean, people are people. But right. uh, with all the therapy, all the treatment, all the monitoring that these uh, nurses are undergoing, it's, there, there's probably less risk with our nurses than there are risks with the general population of nurses who are not under such scrutiny. So, um, you know, I can vouch for, and, and it's, it's yeah. interesting to me, I don't want to name hospitals, but there's some, some hospitals with a very high reputation who in the past didn't work with our nurses. And I, I noticed now that they are working with our nurses more and more. Uh, and I think they're seeing the benefits. Um, so. Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, it does kind of come down to that. I think if you can, trust, for lack of a better word, trust the program in your state, in your area, that they are doing a solid job. And it, it sounds like that, you know, the neurocognitive test is crucial, not only for that sign up of return to work, but, you know, I, as the pharmacist in charge of a hospital that was having to monitor and look for everything, that would certainly put me more at ease, right? To know that this person has gone through that testing and has been cleared, gone through it by somebody who's trained and knows exactly what they're looking for and is taking it seriously and is not going to send them back unless they really believe that they were clear. That would put, you know, a lot of it would peace of mind for me. I know that. And it's interesting then you know, because a lot of people think if they're on MAT, that's it, they could be impaired, but that's not the case, it sounds like, with many of the products, and then it ensures their success, and then it helps you monitor them more, especially with those injections that, you know, did they come for their injection, and they know it. So I think there is a lot of misinformation out there, or just 
we're not sure because we don't have that experience. So this is this is good information. And if I recall, I think you typically monitor your patients for quite some time and you do a pretty thorough review of them on a regular basis, correct? Yeah. Um, so most of our, if, if a nurse has a substance use disorder, mild diagnosis, we typically monitor for about two years. If it's moderate or severe, it's typically a five-year contract. There are some cases where if a nurse has a, um, a severe mental health disorder, such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type one, that is truly verified as bipolar one and truly verified as being a severe then we might monitor those nurses licensure long, um, but we still review them every five years. And if, they, if they're if they stellar for five years, we usually don't continue to, to monitor, but we're, we're always concerned that if a nurse goes off their psychiatric medications, they can destabilize quickly. Um, sure. But yeah, I, and particularly with our buprenorphine uh, participants, uh, it's not a big number, so it's not too too uh, laborious for me. But I do a very in depth review every year, and we. So one of the things we do, we do toxicology that includes testing for buprenorphine. And when we test for the buprenorphine, I not only look to see if buprenorphine's there, but I look to see if the norbuprenorphine is there. And the norbuprenorphine level, if they're using it properly, most often is going to be higher than the, especially if you're administering this sublingually, the norbuprenorphine, which is the metabolite, is going to be at a higher level than the buprenorphine. If you see a lot of, uh, there were two cases we picked up where the nurses actually were not taking their buprenorphine product. Um, it turns out uh, in one case, the nurse was giving it to her brother. And in another case, I'm not sure, but we found out she was uh, adultering. Uh, both of them were adultering their urine specimens. They even went to their treatment provider, they would adulter it and they were putting the buprenorphine in the urine. And when, we, when I looked at our levels, it's like sky high buprenorphine levels and a minuscule amount of norbuprenorphine. Yeah. I immediately knew that was an adultered specimen. Right. Um, so uh, so it's interesting that our biggest problem has been probably more non-compliance with taking it than those who are on it. Um, but yeah, I do an annual review and I look at, uh, those urine specimens to make sure that the, we're seeing higher norbuprenorphine than buprenorphine. I look at the, uh, our, we have weekly nurse support groups that they have to attend. And I look at all those or at least the most recent reviews of those to make sure that they're, you know, in the higher or at least uh, acceptable range uh, with the, the all the reporting that's done. Uh, I also look at the uh, workplace supervisor reports that are also Ooh. quarterly. And then I, I also look at uh, uh, the psychotherapy uh, uh, reports that are quarterly, as long as they're seeing a psychotherapist, which I would think a good majority of, or a good number of our nurses are seeing a psychotherapist. And uh, the uh, prescriber of the buprenorphine product, uh, they do quarterly reports. And if they're seeing a separate psychiatrist or a se separate psychiatric medication management, I'm looking at those reports. So it's a lot of reports to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that's a, that's a good amount of work that I go through on each one of these. And, and uh, certainly what I see compared to the rest of the nurses that are not on these types of products, they, they, they seem to be doing just as well, maybe a little bit better. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I, I uncommonly see significant problems um, that crop up and certainly no more than the rest of our nurses. So Sure. Right. Well, that's great. Well, it sounds like the state of Florida is in really good hands with your program and, and the people that you work with. And I think that's great More success. All right, well, I know this was enlightening for me um, when it comes to MAT and return to work. And I don't know how many people are out there throughout the rest of the United States that do this neurocognitive testing, but I would hope it's incorporated in most of the recovery programs. But I, you know, it, it, as much as you say that, 
I, I still do it more to protect our program uh, and to protect the nurse also to some degree. But I do, it's uh, like I say, we've never had a single nurse that has shown any neurocognitive impairment while on the, the steady stable dose of the buprenorphine. Right. So right. Uh, um, I just I think it, it may be a good practice just to help assure everybody that uh, everything Absolutely. is where it should be. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tanner, for this. I appreciate your time. And this was a lot of great information to share with the listeners. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure, Terry. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.